Hello and welcome to today's special golf news webinar. Keep an eye on your vision concerns brought to you by Moorfields Eye Hospital, Dubai. Even though our lives literally, literally run on computer devices, we're looking at screens right now, it will probably shock you just how much time you spend in front of the screen. Researchers have found that each of us spends between 12 and 17 hours in front of screens every single day, which accumulates to 44 years of your life. And that was just before the pandemic. Now, with work and study from home increasing screen time, childhood myopia is skyrocketing, while adult preventable vision problems are also on the rise. Many serious conditions such as cataracts, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and age-related macular degeneration are also increasing. But all of these are at least treatable and in some cases curable if they are caught early. And so the good news is there is a lot that you can do to take back control, to guard your and your family's eye health. My name is Sally Musa, and I'm so pleased to be joined by three leading health experts from Moorfields Eye Hospital, Dubai. Dr. Ammar Safar is the medical director, consultant, ophthalmologist, and vitreo retinal surgeon. Dr. Salman Waqar is consultant, ophthalmic surgeon, and specialist in adult glaucoma and cataract surgery. And last but not least, Dr. Miguel Morcillo consultant ophthalmologist and chief of cornea and refractive surgery. Moorfields Eye Hospital Dubai is the first overseas branch of Moorfields Eye Hospital NHS Foundation Trust and it's the oldest and one of the largest centers for ophthalmic treatment, teaching and research in the world. Located at the Al Razi Medical Complex in Dubai Healthcare City, the facility provides daycare, surgery, and outpatient diagnostic and treatment services for a variety of surgical and non-surgical eye conditions. From adult to pediatric, simple to complex treatments, the hospital offers a comprehensive range of eye care services provided by specialist teams of consultant ophthalmologists, optometrists, and orthoptists, all under one roof in a state-of-the-art facility. A big welcome to our esteemed specialists today. And Dr. Ahmad, I would love to start with you. Let's talk about some of the most common eye diseases that you are currently seeing. First of all, good morning, Sally, and good afternoon, actually, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. It's really a pleasure for, for us to be uh, uh, joining this uh, webinar. Um, and thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, as you said, uh, Morefields really is a, a leading um, healthcare facility in the world, and we're very proud to be able to provide uh, this uh, same service that's provided in our home uh, hospital in London, here in Dubai, and uh, across the UAE. Now, uh, as you said, the the, uh, the pandemic really had made one major problem that we currently have. Uh, really expand, which is uh, which is the uh, effect of digital uh, screens, or what we now call the digital eye strain uh, syndrome. Basically, the effect of screens of any kind, not just the computer that we're looking at right now, but also our phones um, and and every other device that we encounter during the day, uh, really has a, an effect on our eyes, and uh, it, it has a very um, big toll uh, over the health of the eye. And this has actually expanded. Uh, significantly in the past year, year and a half since we went uh, uh, online with a lot of our day-to-day uh, -day facility uh, um, activities. Now, this is something that I'm sure Dr. Uh, Miguel is going to expand on a bit more. But uh, your question is, what are the most common things we see uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, cases? You know, it's basically a, a, a comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, collection of diseases, if you will. Uh, because we do provide this comprehensive uh, care uh, under one roof. So everything that's related to the eye uh, is provided at Moorfields uh, Dubai. 
um, from a simplest thing like checking uh, your eye routinely, getting your glasses checked. We have a very uh, robust uh, um, optometry service all the way into the very sophisticated advanced surgery related to advanced glaucoma, advanced uh, uh, cataract surgery, uh, uh, refractive surgery, which is vision correction, uh, people who want to get rid of their glasses. Um, and also, of course, uh, one, of, one of probably the main things that we have that sets us apart also is a very robust and very specialized pediatric section that is uh, standalone almost in our hospital uh, that provides uh, specialized care to our little ones. Absolutely. It's so important, you know, particularly for children, they do have uh, different needs uh, when it comes to taking care of their eyes. But you know, coming back to this whole idea of what screens are doing to our eyes, uh, Dr. Ammar, the researchers have been, you know, talking about these increasing eye conditions, particularly, as you say, since the beginning of the pandemic. But what have you been seeing as the impact of this almost constant screen time? What has it been doing to our eyes? So if we talk about this particular issue, the screen time exposure or the digital effect on the eye, uh, the main things that happen are uh, severe dryness and irritation in the eye. Um, also, you have to think about it from a very practical standpoint. Um, basically, we blink pretty much around, let's say, 24, 25 times per minute if we're sitting down regularly talking to each other. Uh, now, why is a blink important? It's important because with every blink, we provide a cover on the cornea uh, in a fresh, if you will, uh, a layer of tears that protect our eyes. Now, when you are actually working uh, at a computer screen, this rate of blinking drops from 24 uh, times per minute to about seven or eight times per minute. Why? Because we're focusing, we're looking at things, we're reading, we're trying to acquire information. So the eye can tolerate that for uh, an hour, two, three, maybe. But if you're doing, you know, like you said, the research showed anywhere between seven and, and maybe even 17 hours of uh, screen time, then this has a big toll on the eye getting really dry, very irritated, and gives you these symptoms of burning sensation, redness in the eye. Uh, you feel like you really need to close your eyes because, because you can't keep it open anymore. This is one major thing that happens. Another very important thing, especially for the little ones, as they are developing, if they're spending a lot of time in front of a screen, their rate of myopia, which is nearsightedness, can increase. Um, and this is really an area of special interest for us at Morpheus because we're now in our pediatric department having new um, ways or new treatments that could potentially curbside a little bit the progression of myopia, slow it down as much as possible, and hopefully, um, you know, get it under control, if you will. Because but let's be honest, um, you know, computers are not going away. We're not going to stop using them, no matter how, how we talk about it. So we have to cope with it and find a solution that actually addresses the problem and protects us at the same time. That's really important. I know as a mom, I'm really concerned about my kids and how much time they spend in front of screens when I talk to other parents. This is the biggest concern right now that, you know, our kids are spending so much time in front of screens and we need to do everything that we can. Like you said, it's not going away to protect them. Um, but before we continue the discussion, uh, let's uh, make sure that everybody knows how they can ask a question, because I know that there are going to be many coming in from our audience. So if you do want to ask a question during the webinar, you can do it by clicking the questions tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions there. And if you do want more information about the panelists, about Moorfields Eye Hospital Dubai, you can do that by clicking on the speakers and the booths tabs at the top of the screen as well. And you can click on that and you can open a new tab and you'll still be able to watch the webinar at the same time. We've even got to polls that are going to be running as well. Get ready for the first question. It will be coming your way and uh, you'll be able to access that uh, in the polls tab right there. Uh, but Dr. Suleiman, I'd like to come to you and ask you uh, about your specialty, which is the silent disease of glaucoma. So firstly, what is glaucoma and what causes it? Uh, thank you very much, Ali. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for inviting us to speak today and also for the kind introduction. 
Also, thanks to the viewers for taking time out of their schedules to join us today as well. I'm sure we're all very grateful to them. So glaucoma is, is basically a term that's used to describe a group of conditions where you have high pressure in the eye, and that can start to damage the nerve that connects the eye to the brain. It's known as the optic nerve. And that can then start to cause slow, irreversible damage to the vision. So as you can imagine, early detection and um, treatment is key because you really want to stop it before it gets to a stage where the damage is already done. And this is why we tend to recommend regular eye examinations um, pretty much for everybody so that the condition is picked up early and prompt treatment is, is initiated in time. Now, in terms of risk factors, most commonly it tends to develop with age. Um, it's just one of those things. Uh, one person may have it, the other may not. They may not, there may not be any particular reason for it. However, in certain conditions, such as if you've had a history of inflammation in the eye or if there's perhaps an injury to the eye, then these kind of conditions can predispose to it as well. But the key to it really is to have regular eye examinations so that if there's any change, it's picked up early and we can promptly act on it. And so what should people be looking out for? What are the symptoms and risk factors here? So that's a great question. So in terms of symptoms, you know, glaucoma tends to really affect the peripheral field of vision such that you have, a, have this kind of constriction of the peripheral field of vision, which keeps progressing until it starts to then affect the central vision, which is a very advanced stage of glaucoma. So towards the end, it's almost like looking through a tunnel. Um, now, but if you are noticing this kind of change, then it's already sadly too late. You really want to stop the condition before any change to vision is noticed. So this is why it's known as the, the silent thief of sight, because by the time that you would notice any change, it may already be too late. So really you want to pick it up at a very early stage when we can see changes developing on our tests, but you cannot see any changes in your vision. And if we can halt it at that stage, then it would not have any impact on your quality of life on your quality of vision throughout your life. So really early detection is the key. I think that's the, the biggest thing to really emphasize throughout this webinar, uh, Dr. Salman, and I know uh, the other doctors will agree too, that you know, with your eyes, it is very easy for things to start very, very slowly and to almost be unnoticeable and you just kind of feel a discomfort or, you know, you notice things going on. It's easy to forget. It's easy to kind of, you know, go, oh, I'll get to it later. It's fine. It's not a big problem. Um, but then it can become something much more serious. And so I think that's the biggest thing here to, to say to everybody, make sure you are getting your eyes tested regularly because there could be things coming up uh, that, you know, you don't realize, but they are there and they will be seen with an eye exam. I can see you uh, nodding there, Dr. Ammar. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you've got more to add to that. that. That is a very, very good point. Actually, if you don't remember anything from this webinar, I think you should remember that. Uh, this actually goes along uh, with every um, aspect. I was, I was basically listening to Dr. Salman and, and when you asked him about the symptoms, the glaucoma is is basically called the si silent blinding disease. Why it's silent? You know, by the time you actually notice your your peripheral visual uh, field loss, it's almost too late, pretty much, because because you really can't bring that back. You can stop it, but you can't bring it bring it back in most cases. So so it's very crucial if you have this family history, for example, uh, of glaucoma, to get your eyes checked because if we catch you when you haven't had any loss yet then that's the perfect time to actually intervene. Same thing with diabetes, for example. When you have a patient who has diabetes, they have to check their eyes, not wait until their vision is gone or their vision is affected and they're saying I'm blurred and whatever, to go and check. Because again, at that point, we can still help, but it's not as good as if we stop it from the beginning. Exactly. Prevention is the most important key here. Uh, Dr. Miguel, I'd love to come to you now. You know, for those of us who wear glasses or contact lenses like myself, um, I've done that, you know, for pretty much most of my life. You know, we think it would be so great to not have to wear glasses, not have to wear contact lenses and just be free of that. Uh, and we hear a lot about uh, laser vision correction, LASIK. But what is that exactly and how does it work? Good afternoon, Sally. And uh, I want to thank you for organizing this uh, webinar and uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be part of it. 
Uh, well, laser is an uh, it is not something new. Uh, it's uh, it's performed in the world probably 25, 30 years old, uh, and basically, uh, laser helps to to remove the the problems related with the glasses because it reshapes the anterior part of the eye. The anterior part of the eye is the cornea, and it's another lens of the of our eyes. That with the laser, the different laser techniques, we can uh, reshape to uh, refocus your your eyes in case they have a, a glasses problem. Basically, to wear glasses, you have to wear glasses because you cannot focus properly, maybe from far, for near, or for both. Uh, and uh, depending on the problem that you have, laser uh, can uh, change the shape of your cornea and refocus the eye, uh, allowing you not to use glasses or contact lenses. I love that. Uh, you know, you've just given us a, a, a very quick summary of exactly, uh, you know, how that works. But what are some of the other different types of laser vision correction techniques that you do use, uh, Dr. Miguel? Uh, it's not only laser. Between the different lasers, uh, there are three main groups of laser surgery. One is uh, called uh, LASIK. Uh, the other is called PRK. It depends on the, how the laser is applied or um, the different uh, depth uh, in the surface of the cornea. Uh, there is another kind of uh, surgeries uh, that uh, are called SMILE. All of them are laser surgeries and most of them are done, especially for people uh, younger than 40, 45 year old. Uh, but also there are another complementary techniques uh, for the cases when we cannot uh, uh, use the laser, or maybe the laser is not enough to solve all the problems, which are the intraocular lenses. We have a, a different kind of intraocular lenses than, that, that can help, especially for people that has high amounts of myopia, hypermetropia, or astigmatism, or for people that after 40, 45 year old, they develop also presbyopia and they need uh, also glasses for for near, uh, complicating the, the use of glasses uh, more and maybe using two kinds of different glasses or, or progressive. But the, the, the summary is that we can use laser or contact lenses uh, to solve probably most of the problems uh, that you can face along all your life regarding the glasses. The only condition is that the, the eye should be healthy and, and, uh, and we have to select the, the eyes for the different kind of surgeries. Exactly. So it very much depends on uh, what solution is best for each patient. It's, it's uh, not, you know, a one size fits all, as we know. Uh, our first poll has gone live. So I'd love for everybody to, to jump onto that and, and tell us what you think. Uh, the first question is, how many hours do you think you spend in front of a screen every single day? Uh, so we've got six hours. Is it about six hours? Is it 12? Is it 17? And also there is don't know. So uh, just see where you might fit in into that, uh, into that variety of uh, answers there. I know mine is quite a lot. I could be possibly in the 12 hour section if i'm going to be really honest and you have to uh, count everything your phone your computer you know what you do wh whether you're doing zoom meetings um you know everything everything that gets you in front of a screen think about that because we tend to really underestimate how many hours that is don't we uh dr amar of course you're a specialist uh, in the diseases of the retina so talk to us about that talk to us about the retina and the most common diseases that do affect it. Okay, so let's just start quickly about what is the retina. The retina is basically a, a membrane that I believe is the most important part of the eye because it's where the vision is generated. If I have to do an analogy, it's kind of like where uh, a camera and you have a, basically a chip for the digital cameras and a film for the, uh, for the old cameras. So a camera does not give you a, any picture if there is no film or no chip in it. Uh, the retina is the same way. So the retina is where the vision is uh, uh, generated, and then it goes to the brain for us to understand what we're seeing. So it is made out of all uh, the nerves, special nerves that, uh, that are sensitive to light, and the electri electrical impulses are made, and they get transferred to our brains. It is very uh, 
important for the eye to have a healthy retina in order for us to uh, get good vision or maintain our vision. So at the same time, our retina, of course, is... Um, you know, being exposed to everything uh, in our life, let's say being exposed to uh, to our age, to, to the light, to uh, uh, the things that we eat and, and drink, and also to our genes. Um, so one of the most common things that the retina is susceptible to is high sugar, or what we call diabetes. So a diabetic patient who has uncontrolled levels of sugar in their blood um, could potentially have a problem in their retina. We call it a diabetic retinopathy. Um, so at the same, by the same token, if you actually control that sugar, even in a diabetic, so a diabetic person who actually controls his sugar can could potentially avoid all the problems that uh, can result from, from that, that condition. So what are such of the you know, problems? Well, the retina could actually get affected to the point where uh, it's a certain thickness. It could swell up a little bit, so that gives you fogginess. It could bleed. It could get pulled on. Uh, so many things could happen as complications of uh, diabetes and cause uh, the, the, this problem. Uh, of course, another issue which happens with age, uh, not for everybody, but there are some risk factors, such as ethnicity, you know, for like Caucasians, for example, females, smokers, in certain parts of the world can get something we call age-related macular degeneration, which is a condition that affects the macula or the central part of the retina and can give you, uh, you know, loss of vision from the central part only. So those are all the diseases, not all, but some of the important uh, diseases that we deal with as retina specialists. Um, of course, there are some other things such as you know, patients who can get small little tiny strokes in the retina, for example, because of high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So as you can see, or as you can probably, you know, uh, follow me with my, with my uh, story here, is that our eyes are basically subject to what we're doing to, to our body. If we eat well, uh, if we protect ourselves, if we protect our body from having high sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and, and exercise well, all of that, we will hopefully, ultimately, actually uh, maintain a good, healthy uh, vision and, and healthy eye in general. It is so important. You know, we have to realize that the body works as one. When we take care of the rest of our body, when we eat well, when we exercise, when we get outside, uh, you know, get into nature, that affects every part of us, including, you know, our eyes. You know, I just, I, I can't imagine, you know, not living without this priceless gift of sight, you know, and it's, it's something that we neglect. We don't, you know, realize how uh, these small changes can actually have such a big impact I mean, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, and as you said, um, we unfortunately, we don't recognize how important something until we start losing it or, uh, you know, not having it, God forbid. Uh, sight is very important. Obviously, our whole, whole life and whole, you know, being is, is through our eyes because we see things and we, um, we live through that. Uh, it is very, very important to lead a very imp uh, a healthy life. And it definitely affects your eyes in every shape and form. Uh, and that takes us back again to the importance of uh, checkups, importance of making sure that if you have a condition, don't deny it. Don't say, uh, you know, it's fine, I'm okay still. When I have a problem, I'll go to the doctor. That is really a culture that needs to change if we need to actually protect ourselves and protect our eyes. Absolutely. You know, when you talked about diabetes and, and, and diabetic patients, can they treat and even cure, you know, conditions that arise from diabetes, doctor? Yes, actually, so things have changed dramatically, literally over the past 15 to 20 years only. Uh, the way we used to treat uh, diabetes and its effect on the eye has changed, and there's been a, a real revolution in how we actually uh, manage these cases, whether in diabetes or in the other one that I mentioned, which is age-related macular degeneration. Uh, in the past, it used to be that we tried to do things in order to reduce the effect. So unfortunately, patients continue to lose vision, but at a slower rate. Uh, in the beginning of this new century, actually, things have changed. The bar was, was really raised in the sense that now we're able to improve vision. So people who lost vision, 
can actually gain it again and uh, be able to function, especially in diabetes, because diabetes affects working age individuals. So people in their 40s and 50s that are in their prime and, and they're losing vision and not being able to perform, that's, that has a huge effect, a negative effect on the society as a, as, as a whole. So yes, can we actually improve things? Can we cure things? Probably not quite yet. The word cure, unfortunately, is not there yet because diabetes is not a curable disease itself. Uh, there are lots of you know work that being done to try and cure diabetes but is it controllable absolutely is it reversible absolutely uh, but all of that also actually depends on what stage does the patient present it so we have conditions sometimes that they present very very uh, advanced very late uh, we can still do very advanced surgery just a couple of weeks ago i had a patient from Seychelles that came over with bilateral blindness both eyes unfortunately um, and she couldn't stop it, she couldn't work anymore. And we did surgery on her eye, very advanced surgery that regained vision for her eye and she was able to actually fly back on her own without any assistance. So that in and of itself can be done in certain cases, but it requires uh, quite a bit of tedious work. It's, it's important, you know, what you just said, it depends on the stage that the patient presents. So once again, the earlier you go in to see your doctor, the better it is for you and for your health. Uh, that poll that uh, we have put out, how many hours do you think you spend in front of a screen every day? 50% of people have said 12 hours. Oh my goodness. Um, a lot of people don't know, 6%, uh, 17, 13% say 17. Oh my goodness. It's, it's not surprising, unfortunately, but uh, this, these are the numbers. Uh, that we are looking at. And uh, there's another poll uh, that is coming up uh, as well, where we are going to be uh, asking you, uh, do you know what you can do to protect your eyes while looking in front of the screen? So that is going to be appearing. Let us know. The answer is just very simple, yes or no. And uh, Dr. Sunman, if I can come back to you, uh, as we look at the silent disease of glaucoma, how does it affect the vision? And th what are the different types there? Thank you, Sally. So, so in terms of how it affects the vision, as, as we were discussing earlier, it tends to cause a, a constriction in your peripheral field of vision. Now, this the speed at which this happens can vary from individual to individual. A lot of different things, like Dr. Amar mentioned, if you have a family history, for example, that can feed into it. 25% um, of people who have a family history will go on to develop glaucoma. So it's a minority, but they do need to have regular checks to have to make sure that it's picked up in time. Now, also the other thing that feeds into it is how high your eye pressure is. Now, if the eye pressure is uh, elevated a little bit, you may not be aware of it yourself, but a regular check would pick that up. But that would cause very gradual, slow de decline in vision. But if the eye pressure is very high, um, in some cases, you might feel pain yourself, and that might prompt a visit to your eye specialist, in which case prompt treatment is required because that can very rapidly cause a, cause a change in your vision. So really, there's a lot of different factors that feed into it. Um, when we see the patient, we tend to take a lot of different measurements with some very precise instruments, and that overall helps us understand what stage of glaucoma the individual is at or what is their risk of developing um, damage to their vision and at what rate through their lifetime. And so we can really individualize treatment to that individual in terms of whether they need eye drops or laser or surgery, depending on the severity of the glaucoma. And, and really the aim ultimately is to halt it and prevent it from getting worse and preserve their quality of life. There's been a lot, uh, as Dr. Ammar alluded to, that has been going on in terms of treating uh, eye diseases. What are the latest treatments and technology that's available for treating glaucoma then? So, so similarly in glaucoma, actually, we're very fortunate that things have, have, have moved forward in leaps and bounds over the last, last 10, 15 years. Um, it used to be at the turn of the century, you know, the, the treatments for glaucoma really were simply either to have one or two kinds of eye drops or perhaps one kind of surgery. And then that was pretty much it. Now we have a whole host of options available to us from many different kinds of very kind of safe and gentle and easy to use eye drops to very gentle laser treatments to minimally invasive surgical procedures, and then more invasive procedures for more advanced cases. So the theme of glaucoma now really is not a one-size-fits-all. It's more 
um, for us to put together all the measurements, uh, your lifestyle, your personal circumstances, your family history, and then try and individualize the treatment to what fits the patient's needs and requirements. And so things have improved tremendously, and, and we are able to preserve and prevent um, a lot of visual damage much more now than we were ever able to before. So we're very fortunate now in that we have a huge, huge amount of uh, resources available to us. Absolutely uh, vital. And, you know, a place like Moorfields Eye Hospital is where you can find that latest technology, where you can find the expertise to help treat this uh, silent disease. And um, don't forget our poll is still running. Do you know what you can do to protect your eyes while you look at screens. Very, very important. Most people are saying yes, 60% so far saying yes, 40% saying no. We are going to get more into that as well. But uh, Dr. Miguel, I would love to come back to you and ask you about, uh, you know, you did talk to us about the various uh, ways that uh, you can use laser vision correction. But how do you know um, what kind of technique is suitable for which patient? Well, during the visit, uh, we have to, to to start for the basics. The basics are, okay, is uh, are you stable? Are you still evolving? Because most of these problems are related to the, the growth of the body in general. So most of the glasses appear while, uh, during childhood or uh, when... Uh, when patients are teenagers, but they become into adult stage and then they start to stop. Uh, in this moment, uh, also uh, there is a general uh, stabilization of the growth and uh, also the, the glasses also stops. It means that the eye is not growing uh, 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 as, as fast as it was growing before. And then we can start to talk about removing the glasses, especially if they are highly dependent. So, when, when we study the, each case, uh, we assess the, the general state of the eye, but the most important part is the cornea, to know if it's uh, uh, possible to do laser or not. Usually, most of the corneas are good for surgery because they are into a, a normal range of uh, shape and especially thickness. This is something that we analyze with, with uh, one machine called corneal topograph, that gives us, give us a lot of information regarding the shape of the cornea. If the cornea is thick enough, then, mm, you should, then the regular laser that we do, the LASIK, uh, it's perfectly uh, suitable to perform. Uh, if the cornea has any concern, sometimes we discover some disease in the cornea during these, these uh, tests, then we can uh, make a, a, an early screening of the problem and maybe treat it in advance. There is one problem called keratoconus that is very uh, uh, frequent in this part of the world. And sometimes we discover when they come to remove the glasses and then we can uh, treat it in an early stage. If the patient qualifies for, for laser, uh, 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 we do, but not all the, the patients qualify for laser uh, because maybe the, the number of diopters is very high usually more than six or eight in myopia, or maybe more than three, four in hypermetropia. These patients, we uh, study the possibility to implant one intraocular lens, which if there is uh, room enough in the anterior part of the eye, it's possible to implant and it's a very easy uh, and simple surgery. I'm talking about patients before the age of 40, 50 year old. When we uh, go from 40 to 50, there is one thing that uh, will appear, all of us, that is the difficulty for reading, the difficult difficult reading. And in this moment, progressively, depending on our activity that we do, as we see our audience is uh, very, very, uh, very fond of using the screens along the day, it will show more and more and more. Then the patient complains that the glasses or the contact lenses that he's using are not good anymore for near. And then they go into the progressive glasses which are different glasses for far and near. In this moment, the laser is not as good in terms of removing the glasses. It starts to be uh, incomplete, the result. And many people that if they are 50 or 55, if they are done laser only, they have to wear glasses afterwards for near. Uh, 
uh, of course, most of the patients are not happy with this situation. And it's when we go into the, the treatment of the, of the presbyopia with intraocular lenses. Uh, and we have today quite advanced intraocular lenses that can give back the vision for far and near that the patient was enjoying when he was 20 or 30 uh, year old. Uh, this is basically the, 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 the decision tree that we take uh, before advising uh, uh, any laser surgery. Uh, of course, uh, it, it should be uh, also uh, checked that the general health of the eye is good. Any disease like glaucoma or diabetes or any retina problem, in this case, uh, they are not as good candidates for refractive surgery. But this is part of the of the screen we do. It's very comprehensive, you know, th and this is vital. It has to be comprehensive in this way. You know, for those who do go ahead and to, uh, with that laser vision correction uh, surgery, what can they expect to be the period of recovery? So, you know, what does the process look like and how long will it take to recover? For, for laser correction, uh, we have, uh, let's say, two kinds of, of different procedures. Uh, I am simplifying, but there are two kinds, especially for the time of recovery. If you know people that did laser, uh, probably you will classify. Uh, uh, for the people that can classify for uh, LASIK, usually the recovery is very fast. In one or two days, most of them, they come back to the um, almost normal life. They come back to the office. They can, they can uh, work with computer again. They even can drive uh, some of my patients, even first day of the post-operative, they come to the first check driving the car. So in, with this surgery, the recovery is very fast. The post-operative is mild with not a big hassle on the eyes. And uh, after one week or two, they have almost recovered completely. Uh, there is another kind of laser procedures that we call surface procedures. We can call, we, probably you have heard about PRK, LASIK, EPILASIC. These are different names of these procedures, trans-PRK. The, the recovery is a bit longer, not too much, but I explain my patients to, to expect one week to get the same result, uh, to come back to, to no, normal uh, work uh, in the office or drive again. Uh, because of the nature of the laser is applied more on the surface, we have to wait until the recovery of the superficial layer of the cornea. The post-operative is a bit tougher. Uh, the first day is uncomfortable, but we give drops to make it easier for the patients. But the patients should be worn like this. Uh, they have to expect this one with recovery. After that, most of the patients uh, restart the, the, the normal life. Fantastic. I mean, you know, for, in most cases, it, it's quite short <laughs> recovery time. I, I'm just uh, seeing that we have uh, lots of questions coming in. So keep those coming in. If you have a question for our doctors, uh, we are going to get to these. Um, the poll that we have been taking, uh, do you know what to do, how to protect your eyes in front of a screen? Uh, yes, 60% are saying yes, 40% saying no. Dr. Amlet, if I can come back to you on this one. Um, you know, it was interesting. I was saying to a friend of mine the other day, and, you know, she was complaining about her eyes um, in front of the, the screen. And I said, you know, are you, do you have the, uh, the blue light uh, correcting uh, lenses uh, and any glasses like that? And she said, no, she didn't know about those. You know, is, is that something that we, sh we all should be wearing? Uh, blue light blocking glasses or what are the other ways that we can protect our eyes in front of screens? Uh, okay, so I will get to that in just a second, but I just want to take one, uh, maybe 30 seconds to just comment on what uh, Miguel said about the LASIK. Um, I, I just want to point out one thing. Uh, if you notice in his answer, the level of detail is really very impressive. And I think this is basically uh, what we call, we happily call the Morfield's way. What probably sets us apart from any other institution is that attention to detail. We want, uh, we, we see every patient and we focus on one thing only, which is a great outcome, a great long lasting outcome for the patient. So LASIK, especially LASIK, you now can go to some molds and get it in the mold. 
that that you know how different is that from the procedure you get at more fields it's different because uh, uh, the more fields way is we look at details we want to make sure that you get an outcome that is good not only for a month or two or a year or two but for a lifetime so I'm very proud to to uh, to have a team and and um, you know of consultants really that are uh, doing a great job uh, with this kind of level of attention to detail. Now back to your question, <laughs> I just had to say this because I was very proud of his answers. Um, the issue of uh, blue light, blue light. Uh, if you Google it, uh, you'll get so many answers. Um, so what's really the truth about the blue light? Does it really uh, injure your retina? Does it have any toxicity to your eye and things like that? Uh, the, the final research or the final word on it is that no, it does not affect your retina from a, uh, you know, like a, a toxicity standpoint. Does it affect your sleep pattern? Yes, it does. So you don't sleep as well uh, if you are exposing your eyes to a blue screen, for, uh, I mean, to blue light for a long time, especially if you read before you sleep or if you use the laptop before you sleep. So you don't uh, have an, a nice deep uh, sleep cycle and you wake up uh, tired and, and not rested. Uh, however, uh, also the exposure, as we saw, you know, 50% plus use the, the computer for 12 hours. If you block some of that light throughout the day, it, it could make you uh, more comfortable. So I want to make sure that I, I, you know, I'm clear here. It's not toxic to you, but it is better to block it because it gives you some comfort. The more important things to do is to basically take breaks. If you know you're going to have a meeting for four hours or whatever, then try to take a break every, every hour if you can, if not every two hours. So the rule of, rule of thumb that is practical uh, is maybe every hour take another 10 minutes uh, against it where you're not looking at any screen. So don't stop the meeting like this and then grab your phone and say, now I'm going to check my messages. This is not a this is not a break, okay? A break is for you to actually look out the window, try to relax your eye muscles as much as possible. Another thing that could help, remember the issue of blinking and the dryness that happens. Uh, if you actually can apply some, some drops that lubricate the eye, also that would protect you and make, make sure that your eye is, is very uh, moist. But one thing I would want to point out specifically for our kids, and we all know I, I personally know, uh, you know, patients come to me and bring, bring their kids, teenagers usually, and they try to kind of scare them in front of me and say, listen, listen, the doctor will say this. And some of them even just like wink at me, say, you know, tell them not to use a computer. I, I really think this is not a good strategy to scare them, number one, or to make it a mandatory, oh, absolutely not, you cannot use the computer, I'm going to ground you. Uh, it is something that is useful, first of all, we have to admit, uh, the computers are very useful, and uh, you know our kids are are learning now through the computer. Um, so we need to make sure that first of all we get their trust by telling them, look, you, you can use it; it's okay, but there are some rules. Okay, so uh, no binge watching, no uh, you know staying for five hours on a computer nonstop. Uh, apply these things. I think they will be very willing to compromise and meet you in the middle than to just say absolutely no, you can't use your uh, laptop or your tablet. Um, so, so those are some of the you know, things that we have to adapt, adopt in our um, life and, and try to uh, make sense of it and, and use this very nice device, but at the same time, protect our eyes. Well done. I think uh, that's really important advice because uh, we kind of just... I've seen, you know, a lot of parents go, I'm just confiscating your devices and everything. And it's actually not the solution because literally everything in our lives runs on a screen in one way or another. Um, you can't even go and pay a bill or, you know, go to the police station or whatever without getting on your phone, um, you know, and using an app to, to do it. So it's it's really, uh, we're forced into that. So we just have to be really smart about dealing with it. Um, and it's interesting because one of the questions that we have come in here, this one's from Shelby, uh, is asking particularly about that violet blue light and the screen uh, producing those photons between 380 to 500 nm, which are high energy, and asking about the long term at risk of exposure to these kind of wavelengths of light? The, the, short, I'm sorry, the short answer is it's not 100% known what is the long-term effect. Uh, but so far, like I said, the, the data is conflicting. Some studies, all of them are small and anecdotal studies 
Uh, some studies say there is an effect. Others say there isn't that much effect. So like I said, should we all be buying them and putting them on? Probably not. But if you know that you are like an IT person where you're sitting all day uh, in front of the screen without any breaks, um, I think breaks are more important, to be honest with you. But having a screen that protects a little bit of the light that is getting into your eye could potentially be helpful, definitely not harmful. I just want to come back uh, very quickly before we jump in uh, for more of our questions. This is a really important poll question right here. Um, how often do you go for an eye exam? Do you go every six months? Do you go once a year? Do you go rarely? Do you never go? Or do you forget your appointments? Are you one of those people who forgets to to make an appointment to begin with? So that's our next poll question right there. But Dr. Salman, I'd love to come back to you and, and ask you about cataracts. And, and um, you know, in particular, they're quite common. And, you know, so take us through a little bit of, of the causes and treatments there. Thank you, Zali. So cataracts are indeed very common. Um, generally, they develop with age, so that, um, you know, sort of going past the age of 40, mostly 50 onwards, we start to develop. So, so to begin with, what is a cataract? We're all born with a lens in the eye. That's our natural lens in the eye. And it's very clear when we're born. But every day, every year, as life progresses, it starts to become less clear. It's not so much of an issue when we're younger, but as we get older, it starts to become misty, um, and that can start to impact our vision in, in, the, in regards to the clarity of vision, the quality of vision. You may get a lot of glare from oncoming headlights, for example. Um, and in general, that can start to then affect the quality of life. So this is what cataracts are. Now, the main reason for cataracts is just um, developing with age, but also other conditions such as inflammation in the eye, if you have a history of trauma to the eye, um, perhaps if you're diabetic, uncontrolled diabetic, these can all accelerate development of cataracts as well. In terms of treatment, the only treatment at the moment is, uh, is simply to replace the lens in the eye with a new artificial lens, thereby restoring the clarity of vision. And this is what uh, Dr. Miguel was alluding earlier to as well, in that we have a lot of different lens options now to not only restore the quality of vision, but also give us the ability to have unaided, you know, uh, which basically means you don't need glasses for distance, but also to have the chance of not even needing reading glasses in time as well. So cataract surgery has, has progressed tremendously. We can not only restore the vision affected by cataracts, but we can also reduce dependence on glasses towards the latter half of your life as well. And this is uh, very much, you know, one of those age uh, related uh, eye diseases as well. Uh, you know, can you give us more of a of a background on those kind of diseases of of, of those that are related to age specifically? Absolutely. So there's a, quite a few conditions that tend to develop more with with age, and cataracts is one of them. People may develop floaters in their in their eyes, and sometimes if you're looking at a light background, you might see the little sort of uh, almost transparent things floating in and out of your vision which is essentially because of a change in the in the jelly at the back of the eye with age. Um, you may also develop, as Dr. Amar had very, very nicely described before, um, retinal conditions such as macular degeneration, which tends to come on with age, and then has different kinds to it. There's, the, there's a dry kind where it's just wear and tear at the back of the eye, and then there's a the wet kind where you have active blood vessels leaking at the back of the eye, and that might, might require prompt treatment. Um, in addition, of course, our general health changes with age as well. So the effect of diabetes, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of these things can not only manifest in our body, but they can also affect our eyes with regards to bleeding in the retina or perhaps other changes in the retina as well. Um, and then, of course, looking more at the front of the eye, just general sort of dryness on the surface of the eye, um, the clarity of the cornea, all of these things can change with age. And this is why as the years progress, it's really, really very important to have annual eye examinations to pick up any condition early and to treat it in good time. I think you've just given us a clue there as to what is uh, appropriate for uh, eye examinations. How often should you be getting your eyes checked? We're taking a poll from everybody who is watching right now. Uh, do you do it every six months? Do you do it once a year? Do you rarely do it at all? Never? Or are you somebody who forgets to make an appointment? Uh, Dr. Amar, I'm going to uh, ask you about that uh, now. In fact, how often should we be 
uh, getting our eyes checked? Because I don't think it's the same for everybody, is it? Well, yes, of course. First, again, uh, it depends on what you have. So if you're diabetic, uh, also it depends on what level of diabetes you have, controlled, not controlled, all of that. There are some criteria and recommendations put out by the American Academy of Ophthalmology and all other uh, professional bodies as to how frequently does the patient come in. But definitely uh, for children, let's say, I would recommend any child, let's say without any problems, so the parents are not noticing anything, not noticing any squinting or anything like that, they should get their child checked uh, once at least uh, at age probably four, three or four. Uh, some people might say earlier uh, even. Why? Because there is a condition called amblyopia or commonly called um, lazy eye where one eye could be weaker than the other and if that's the case it becomes lazy and it doesn't really uh, develop well. And this, this is something that you can't really you know, expect a child to tell you I can't see out of one eye and I can't see out of the other because they don't know. So that really makes, um, for example, school screenings very important. Uh, because, you know, we have a window of opportunity to treat this, which is the first eight or nine years of age. And after that, unfortunately, it becomes untreatable. So for children, I think everybody should get an eye examination. Now, if you have a problem at an earlier age, please take your child earlier. So, for example, if you have a baby even that has crossed eyes that are going in, that is something that you really need to get uh, uh, looked at quickly. If you have a, an eye, uh, you know, that has a, a weird reflex on pictures where one, one cornea or, one, you know, instead of having the red eye, for example, you get a white reflex. That's something that's urgent that needs to be even in a baby checked immediately. Um, so in adults, uh, I think, you know, once a year definitely uh, is a recommendation. If you have a disease of some sort, then you have to actually check it uh, earlier depending on what your doctor recommends. Absolutely. And in terms of... You know, I'm, I'm sorry. Don't ignore anything that happens to your eye, please. Okay. So you wake up one day, you see something flying or flashing lights or something like that. Don't blow it off and say, oh, it's, I was just tired and, and didn't sleep well, which we unfortunately tend to do sometimes. Don't do that because this could be an early sign of a problem that's happening in your retina. If we address it right then and there, it's much easier than waiting until you lose vision. So please do not ignore. Eyes are very uh, valuable and very sensitive. Do not ignore any, uh, any signs you get from them. Absolutely. Make sure you're always, always going in, making it a priority, getting your eyes checked. Uh, but uh, just very quickly, in terms of kids, uh, do you recommend every six months for children, you know, those who are not displaying, you know, serious problems or issues? Well, if they wear glasses, then yes. Uh, but if they don't wear any glasses and their, their vision is, is 20-20 or 6-6 vision without any correction and everything is okay, then they can have it once a year. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we have a, a question that's coming from Hassan uh, saying, I have been seeing a blur in my eyes for a few days. I'm 21 years old. What should I do now? Dr. Ammar. Well, if he has a blur in his vision, um, if he's saying one eye, if I heard you correctly, uh, this, despite being young, I think he needs to be seen. I don't know what the details are, if he wears any contact lenses or uh, glasses or anything like that, but he definitely needs to uh, see a doctor. Um, there are signs, obviously, if there's redness or something like that, but, but a blurry vision is not a good thing. He needs to be seen uh, and, and the diagnosis needs to be made. Very important. Uh, Rahima was asking, is glaucoma treatable? I believe, uh, and we have one more uh, question from Dr. From, uh, Abdul Hamid for uh, Dr. Salman as well, asking about the latest in terms of techniques to treat glaucoma. Dr. Salman, I believe that you've, you've mostly covered uh, these uh, kind of issues, correct? I don't think there's anything else that you'd want to add to that. Um, no, that's, thank you very much for those questions. Um, yes, I would just like to re reiterate basically that um, glaucoma is treatable in the sense that if damage has already happened, we cannot reverse that at present. There's a lot of research happening around the world, and hopefully we will have those answers in, in the years ahead as well. But if we are able to halt the progression, then we can preserve your vision for the years ahead. Now, what can we do to halt the progression? That We have a huge range of options available to us now, ranging from simple eye drops, very comfortable simple eye drops, to very gentle, easy to do uh, laser treatments. And then if those don't work, we can progress on to different kind of surgical options. But, we, but within that, we don't only now have big operations to be 
offered only. We also have very easy, minimally invasive surgical procedures as well, which we can tailor depending on the severity of glaucoma. So there's a lot of hope uh, with glaucoma treatment at the moment, and we have all of those treatment options available here at Morefields. Um, and we can very much individualize the treatment to the uh, patient's needs. Fantastic. Uh, so absolutely, once again, uh, it is a, a great time to go and make an appointment and get that uh, checked out as well to see uh, what can be done. Uh, Dr. Miguel, um, this question coming in as well, how safe is laser vision correction? I think there is a, an issue with the sound. Dr. Miguel, we can come back to you uh, for that one. Uh, this I'm one is... I'm hearing you now. I yes. don't know why, but, but the sound was, was cut while you were speaking. No worries. Can you repeat the yes. question, please? Yes, of course. How safe is uh, laser vision correction? Are there any particular risks that to watch out for there? This is a frequent question that the patients ask, of course, most of them, uh, because, of course, uh, they are going to, to face a procedure to improve the quality of the vision, but but uh, they would, don't want to get a, a worse, a bad result of it. The key is the the the, the first visit, the, the assessment. Uh, in that uh, in that visit, as I explained before, we analyze the, the problem that the patient have has, and also how is the eye in general and, to, and we choose the the most convenient technique the, the technique that is less invasive and that that gets the the highest result saying that of course every surgical procedure has uh, has a theoretical risk of course but is the the same risk that we can have when we drive our car on when we get a plane we don't we don't uh, uh, drive our car or take a plane without uh, checking it before we start. So this is what we do before the surgery. Uh, thanks God, these techniques are not new, are very old, and there are uh, rigorous selection criteria for these patients. And I told the patient, this is very simple. If you accomplish the selection criteria, you can go for it because your eyes accomplish the conditions. But this is not only the, the, the only thing we can do. We provide an excellent technology the cutting technology in the world, thanks, thanks God, in Dubai here, we are, uh, in our branch, we have uh, available the same kind of technology that we can have available in our mother clinic in London. And not only, of course, uh, the, the doctors that we perform the surgery, in the, the team doctors that we per, the, perform the surgery in the clinic, we are quite experts in these surgeries. I personally am performing this surgery since 1998 with a very excellent training. And after the procedure, we encourage to have a proper uh, post-operative management of the eyes. It's simple, but it's very important, at least until the, the eye heals properly. For instance, I don't let my patients, especially it's important for the ladies, for instance, not to use makeup, not to uh, take shower normal, washing the eyes, swimming, uh, all the things that keep the eyes a little bit uh, non-contaminated. With a good selection and a efficient treatment and cutting edge, with cutting edge technology and a proper post-operative, we can say that is the, the level of safety is incredible high. Uh, to have a compli complicated cases doing this, it's really, really, really very infrequent. I can, I, uh, we don't have uh, uh, um, figures of safety, but I think this could be comparable to, to fly. All right, very good. Um, we have more questions uh, come through, some really great ones here. Uh, a very uh, a, a quick question here from Hajira asking, uh, can you please suggest a treatment for watery eyes, uh, Dr. Ammar? Well, to, to treat it properly, we need to first of all understand why is it watery. Uh, is it watery because, uh, because of irritation, infection, or is it blockage in the uh, tear canal. So there is a tear canal that actually drains the tears from our corner here all the way to our throats. Um, and if there is a, a blockage in that canal, then the eye becomes completely watery. Uh, the treatment for this is obviously totally different than there if there is an allergy, for example, where the, it's overproduction of the tears. 
So there are so many uh, different ways to treat it. Um, and again, this will require first a proper diagnosis. Excellent. Uh, this one uh, coming in as well. Can I ask you, Dr. Salman from Maryam? She's asking, at what age can you be affected by glaucoma? Muted. I think he is muted. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Maryam, for the question. Um, so as I was saying before, um, generally glaucoma tends to develop with age. So sort of. 40 onwards. Rarely it may develop at birth as well, but of course that would be picked up at the eye checks that are done at the time of birth. Um, for younger uh, individuals sort of in their teens, it's very, un it's very, very uncommon for them to develop glaucoma, although that can happen as well, but it is not common. Um, so generally it tends to develop with age. Um, what we tend to recommend is, as, as we've been saying all along, have regular um, eye examinations, but particularly if you have a family history of glaucoma, it's just really important to know that you have a 25% higher risk of developing glaucoma. So if somebody related to you by blood has glaucoma, then definitely you should go along and have your eyes checked by a glaucoma specialist every year. Okay, very important. Uh, we've got uh, some more questions uh, coming in here. This one uh, is a really interesting one from Bilal. It says, I'm suffering from squint diplopia. Closed angle glaucoma in both eyes, cataract also in both eyes. He says, I've lost my left eye and only 10 to 15% center vision remains in the right eye. Is there any treatment available for multiple vision conditions? Who would like to take this one? I think it sounds mostly glaucoma related, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go ahead with that. So, so thank you for that question and, and for reaching out. So um, the squint is secondary to the, the decrease in vision. So the reason our eyes stay straight is because when we're fixating on an object with good vision, that's what keeps our eyes focused and straight. If we have decreased vision in one eye or the other, the eye doesn't have anything to fixate on, so it tends to drift, and that's where the squint comes from. Um, in terms of the glaucoma, as I was saying before, um, at the moment, the treatment for glaucoma is basically to halt progression. We're not at that stage, technologically speaking, anywhere in the world at present that we can bring back vision. So we cannot reverse the damage to the nerve that connects the eye to the brain, but we can halt that. In addition, if there are cataracts developing, of course, those would be then adding on to the visual impairment by further blocking light from getting into the eye. So one of the sort of, in this particular case, one of the more reversible uh, causes would be simply having the cataracts looked at and assessed to see if they're, if they're removed, what percentage of vision can be restored, but at the same time ensuring that the eye pressure, the glaucoma, does not destabilize with the cataract surgery as well. So it's a complex situation which just kind of requires a very comprehensive assessment, but certainly there are some parts of it where hopefully we can reverse um, the vision back to a much better state. I just, you know, I love how you guys are so on it. This is just fantastic. You know, this is the kind of knowledge and trust that you want to see with the doctors that you are going uh, to take care of your eyes for you. Can diabetic retinopathy lead to blindness? How can I avoid it for Mary, Mary Thomas? Absolutely can, unfortunately. Uh, and, and the only way it can lead to blindness is by neglecting it. Diabetes is a disease you do not neglect. Uh, period. So uh, it, it not only leads to blindness, it can lead to so many things like uh, strokes and heart attacks and, uh, um, and, and loss of limbs. Um, so, so you really need to not neglect diabetes. And how do you avoid it? The, the simple answer is get your diabetes under control quickly, as soon as you can, as, you, as soon as you're diagnosed, and check your body. So check your eyes, your kidneys, your, you know, get your doctor to basically get a, get a specialist who is an endocrinologist is what we call them, the people who take care of the diabetes. Uh, uh, see you and evaluate each and every part of your body. From an eye standpoint, please check your eyes regularly whether you have a problem or not. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Miguel, can myopia be completely cured? Uh, of course, uh, with with the laser uh, treatment, we remove all the myopia completely. Uh, but I have to, to to be honest and say that along the life, the eye can change. And even if some long time can pass, maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years, 
Of course, because the myopic condition remains on the eye. Remember that myopia appears because, because genetically the eyes are programmed to grow, to grow a little bit more. That creates a defocus on the image when it gets into the eye. That is why I pointed out the importance of being stable, because being stable is key to get a, a long-term good results. We avoid the patients sometimes, unfortunately, uh, very, very few cases, but they told me I did my laser surgery, and after a few years, the glasses appear again, probably because they didn't wait until the stabilization could be assessed. But once the eye is stable, we can do the surgery, we remove the myopia completely, we refocus the eye, and then, of course, life goes on. If the patient grows and it's, the life is long, we'll arrive 40, 45, 50, and then the near glasses will appear. This is a different problem. But regarding the myopia, maybe this patient, will, he will be 50, 60. Of course, it's possible some cases of myopia may appear. We take this in consideration before doing the laser, and we keep a little bit of the thickness of the cornea, just in case we have to enhance the treatment. So most of the patients, if they do the laser, they don't have to suffer if the myopia rarely appears again because it can be enhanced. It can be done another laser treatment. Most of the cases have enough thickness in the cornea to do so. Fantastic. Another question uh, from Bilal. That last question was from Maya. Thank you, Maya. Uh, this other question from Bilal saying, uh, my optic nerve uh, was immediately damaged uh, after birth due to a brain injury. Can the optic nerve damage be treated now? I'm not sure what the age is of, of this patient and, and other factors, but uh, that's the question that we have. Dr. Ammar. Unfortunately, uh, optic nerve damage until today cannot be reversed or fixed. Uh, there is a lot of research uh, going on to try and use the uh, stem cells to see if that can revive a dead nerve, if you will, or an affected nerve or an affected retina. But until, <clears throat> excuse me, until today, there hasn't really been any breakthrough in that uh, in that field. So um, the, the short answer, unfortunately, is not yet. Hopefully, in the near future. And of course, more fields is uh, part of research and, and development in this area. It's very important. This is a constantly uh, evolving area. Some questions now about uh, food and particularly vitamins as well. Robert asking this question, what are the foods that improve eye health? And Anisa asking, or Anise rather, beg your pardon, asking, uh, can I take uh, any vitamins to prevent eye issues? So if I, I can take that, and if any of my colleagues have any comments, uh, please jump in. Um, in general, let's start with foods. And I'm, as a retina specialist, I would recommend in general for my patients who are at a certain age and, you know, with age-related issues uh, to, uh, to consume a lot of the um, green leafy vegetables. So um, spinach, arugula, kale, things like that have a lot of nutri nutrients that actually are quite helpful and nutritious to the retina itself. Uh, anything that has also uh, omega-3 fatty acids, fish, for example, specifically salmon, is quite good and healthy for the retina. Uh, in general, avoiding things such as smoking and drinking alcohol uh, is, is quite uh, also important. Uh, a lot of people are surprised that smoking can affect the eye, and the answer to that is absolutely it can, especially the retina, and especially in people who have diabetes and, and uh, macular degeneration. So those are some of the things that, um, that, as far as food is concerned. Now, vitamins, I get this question a lot in clinic. Uh, are there any drops I can use as vitamins to treat my eye? The answer is no. I'm not aware of any eye drops uh, that are vitamins. There, there is a vitamin uh, uh, pill uh, called um, Preservision, which is a trade name, um, but it's basically a formula that was uh, designed and studied and the ARED stands for Age-Related Eye Diseases Study. So this is a big study that was conducted to see if there are vitamins that can protect the eye from developing advanced stages from macular degeneration and also cataract. And it turns out that, yes, if you have certain findings in your retina, it could reduce the progression of this disease. So those are vitamins that we give to patients who have these criteria and have these findings. So it's not, it's not something I would recommend to everybody. 
Um, but it's definitely something that, um, you know, that if we find these findings that we would give. Finally, I just want to say that the issue of carrots, everybody says, oh, carrots are good for your eyes. You have to have a lot of carrots. Uh, the answer is absolutely good, uh, true. It is, but it's not the only uh, magic food that we have to consume. As I said, to have a balanced uh, fruits, vegetables, um, and fish, I think are all very, very healthy to the eye. Mm. Fantastic. You know, so that's true because some people are thinking, is that really a thing uh, about the carrots? Apparently, yes. Uh, but OK, so we have some more questions uh, here. Roxana is really enjoying uh, the webinar, saying uh, thank you so much uh, because uh, the eyes are, of course, a very important part of our body. And I'm going to take uh, her last question, in fact, um, as part of an overview, if you will, please, Dr. Ammar, about uh, your team and what the hospital uh, provides that in terms of let's go first for the services well as you earlier said in your introduction we have pretty much uh, everything related to the eyes uh, from the very simple stuff all the way to the very advanced uh, cases um, we're quite uh, uh, proud to offer this kind of service uh, very high service really because we are, like you said, a, a branch actually of Morphe's London. We're not affiliated, we're a branch actually of London. And we apply the same exact uh, criteria and, and methodology that is applied in London here in Dubai. So the, the level of, uh, of uh, uh, practice is quite high. The services are basically everything uh, related to eyes from uh, cornea to, uh, let's start even earlier, like the eyelids even. The eyelids, of course, uh, can be affected sometimes, and uh, whether cosmetically or uh, medically. So the eyelids, the cornea, the front part of the eye, uh, the cataract surgery with the most advanced uh, techniques available, um, the LASIK procedures that uh, Miguel uh, explained with a very, very high uh, quality of, of uh, of experience and machinery uh, all the way into the retina and all of the, we have a very um, wide team of, of uh, retina specialists, very, very highly skilled uh, medically and surgically. And of course, like I said, we're very proud of having the uh, team of, of the pediatric ophthalmology that, that gives service to our little ones. In addition, for those who have unfortunately, say, lost an eye because of a trauma or something like that, we have the service of actually uh, uh, creating a, an artificial eye uh, that matches your other eye. It's really a very unique service. We call it an oculist that uh, does that, uh, and he's very, very uh, artistic and, and makes the eye look exactly like the other one, at least for a cosmetic standpoint. Uh, also, genetics uh, is, is really a very important aspect right now um, in, in our specialty, and uh, we have a genetics team also that is uh, able to provide genetic counseling and testing to know exactly what kind of a problem does this patient have, what what do they expect uh, as far as they're you know building a family and having their own kids, what's their risk for having any issues if they themselves have a, a genetic eye problem. Uh, we recently actually added a couple of very important uh, uh, things that I, I feel add a service to our patients. Uh, one of them is an optical shop where our patients can actually get their contact lenses and glasses uh, fit in the in the hospital itself, uh, if that's in the case that they don't want to uh, go with a uh, refractive surgery. We've also added a very rare service uh, in, in the UAE, which is electrophysiology, which is basically a, a, a condition or a, 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 manage, a diagnostic tool that measures the electricity from the retina. It's kind of like when you have the heart tracing, so we call EKG. Uh, same thing happens in the eye. You have electricity that you can actually map. So all of these things actually uh, provide this very comprehensive service to our patients with one focus and one focus only. Again, like I said, uh, we focus on our patients and nothing else. We want to make sure that patients get the best care possible. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, uh, not compromise any care because of any other uh, issues or any other uh, factors. So that's, in, in a nutshell, what we do clinically. But also, we're not here only to see patients. Um, we, we are, part of our mission is to actually educate and uh, conduct research. And we're very, very proud to be teaming up with um, Muhammad Bad Rashid University and be uh, the ones who are teaching the uh, doctors of the future 
uh, basically all the uh, medical students at uh, Mohammed bin Rashid University rotate to more fields and learn ophthalmology from more fields. And we're very proud to have uh, that affiliation. We also conduct research. And of course, we have international meetings and all of that. I don't think that time allows to, to discuss that. But these are some of the things that we do at this hospital. And hopefully, uh, your, your audience will be uh, uh, interested, at least, uh, you know, visiting us and see what we have to do. It is absolutely incredible, the, the breadth and the depth of what you do at Moorfields Eye Hospital in Dubai. But to, just quickly, if we can just answer uh, Roxana's question, whether you have a specialist, in fact, uh, that deals with Moosin's ulcer? Yes, we do, of course. Um, so basically, uh, like I said, this is in the anterior uh, segment of the eye, and, and uh, we have a team of doctors that, uh, that t deal with that. Um, so, so uh, you know, there's really, I, I cannot think of any particular condition, uh, even ocular oncology, which is quite rare. Uh, we do have the service, and uh, uh, a, a Professor Mandeep uh, Sagu uh, comes from London on a regular basis. Uh, he's a, a world famous uh, ocular oncologist to actually see patients and, and operate. This is unusual, very very unusual cases. But even those cases, we have uh, we have uh, coverage for them. So the answer is yes. Absolutely fantastic. The final thing that I just really want you to to emphasize here, because you know this is the thing that concerns people the most when they want to go and find somebody for treatment for their eyes and it's the issue of trust so why above all should our audience be trusting Moorfields Eye Hospital uh, above anywhere else uh, I think like I uh, mentioned before uh, I honestly when I think about it look uh, patients have uh, choices and especially in Dubai uh, there is a, a very wide selection of hospitals that all have technology they all have machines um, and also have good doctors. Uh, but what really sets us apart, in my opinion, is that patient focus uh, and, and the fact that we stick with science. We don't really have any other considerations other than making sure that the patients are treated correctly by the book without any compromises. I really think this is basically number one thing uh, of our quality and our uh, uh, double checking everything which which by the way takes a little bit more time and that may have been also noticed some people say that uh, our examinations take longer than others that might be true and we're working on making things as efficient as possible but at the same time you know you don't want to be cutting corners with your eyes you know when you when it comes to your eye health if you're planning to have a surgery if you're planning to have a lasik or any surgery I wouldn't want uh, my my child you know my my daughter for example to get a lasik uh, uh, without any proper uh, check. So we don't cut corners and we really uh, focus on making sure that everything is done scientifically without any compromise to the patient and the patient uh, uh, outcome. I couldn't agree with you more. That's exactly what I would want for myself, for my family, for the priceless gift of sight that we have what an outstanding webinar what incredible uh, experts and guests we've had with us today uh, thank you dr ammar safar dr salman Bakar, and dr miguel Murcillo. thank you all so much for sharing your incredible expertise in this area uh, and i know uh, you've given our audience so much uh, to go with now and to make sure that we do take care of our eyes to make sure that we do uh, take those proportions it's so important you do get your eyes checked and don't forget that you can of course consult with each of them and many more of the best uh, eye health experts at moorfields eye hospital in dubai and of course a big thank you to our fantastic audience today for joining in the discussion and the session is going to be available online on the Gulf News YouTube channel as well. If you want to go back, listen again, share it, uh, in fact, with those that you know and love. And don't forget to subscribe. Uh, my name is Sally Musa, and I wish you the very best of health. Thank you, and see you next time.